July. Y'all heard about that? My goodness. It's fabulous. Y'all ready to hear the word of God? Come on, you ready to hear the word? Here we go. Uh, we're blasting off right now in Acts 16, verse 16. Chapter 16 and verse 16. Following the adventures of Paul and Silas and Timothy and, and, and Luke, who has just jumped on board in the title of the message today, is Behind the Scenes. That's the title. Behind the Scenes. And this is Paul's second missionary journey. Now, what I'm going to tell you about today, you hear me say all the time, this is the most important thing. That's the most important thing. That's the, you know, I, I think that, I believe, I believe that the most important thing is that you have the security of your own salvation. The next thing is that you know who you are in Christ and most Christians do not. And then the third thing is what we're going to be talking about today. And you may have never heard this scripture, scripture like this. I'm going to give you number one right now. Every believer needs discernment. If you don't have discernment, you are a duck flying in the middle of the midnight. You can't see the stars. You don't know if it's up or down or which way. And boom! You had a jet liner get sucked right into the engine. Acts 1660. 16. As we were on our way to the place of prayer, let me translate that for you. They were going to church. I'm telling you, they were going to church. Okay? Might not be church like we have it, but they were going to church. Being in church is, is where we not only hear the preaching of the word, but it, it connects you into relationships. And like we heard the other night, you get to put down roots and, and you get to jump on board and be part of the ship and grab the oar. It goes on to say that we were met by a slave girl who was possessed by a spirit of divination, claiming to fortune to foretell future events and discover hidden knowledge. See that how it says that in the in the amplified version, claiming to foretell future events and discover hidden knowledge. And she brought their her owners much gain by her fortune telling. She kept following Paul and the rest of us shouting loudly, These men are the servants of the Most High God. They they announced to you the way of salvation. Now when I read that I say Goodness, they get free advertising. But I'm going to get into that in a minute. It was not any good free advertising. But if you're new on the Lord and you're still calling the psychic hotline, let me just tell you right now. You need to see behind the scenes. You know? You, you tried to get a hold of the future, you just went dial a devil. I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but that's who you're talking to. These guys who these guys who call up some hot chick on some 900 line and everything. You know who you're talking to? You're talking to some grandma somewhere. Okay? So, don't think that's what's going on behind the scenes. Here we go. It became annoying. Look at verse 18. And she did this for many days. Then Paul, so she was doing this for many days. Many. So, then Paul being sorely annoyed. I like it. I mean, I, he's, he's mad. <laughs> sorely annoyed. I've never said that anybody or myself was sorely annoyed. I think it's going to be a new phrase of mine. You look like you were sorely annoyed. <laughs> I saw some people walk in, look like they've been sucking on a lemon, baptized with one. And they, uh, they look like they really need to be in church today because they were sorely I don't know if it happened to them last night on the way to church. Whatever, it doesn't matter. But look, if you're in the house of the Lord today, then here's some good things. So he was sorely annoyed and worn out. He turned and said to the spirit within her, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very moment. Now listen, teenagers, if your mama tells you you got a messy room, do not do this. Okay? Come out of her. You, you clean devil, you. Don't do that. It's not going to work. So how did Paul know that there was a spirit behind this? <clears throat> it's called discernment. I'm amazed at some young Christians that they can see something. Right? For what it really is. And some people have been a Christian for 40 years. And they're still like... They, they don't know... You know, they can't see anything. Discernment. What is discernment? It's a leading of the Holy Spirit 
And Jesus proclaimed in John 16, 13 that, that the Holy Spirit would lead us after he's gone. He's gone, but he lives inside of us. And he said that the Holy Spirit would lead us, and that's how he does it. This is not something that you can explain. And, and denominational church people, they, you know, they might move in a little of this, but they have not even a clue what it is. And some spirit-filled people can be filled with the Spirit of God and filled with some other kind of spirit. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Discernment is something like this. You just know. And you don't know how you know. And then it dawns on you, it must be God. They told me. It's something, it's a warning bell. It says, don't get close to that person. Or look what you've done to yourself. All of a sudden you wake up one day and you say, it's because of my association with this certain person. This is how I got myself in this position. Sometimes you thought you discerned something and it turns out wrong. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You thought you heard from God, you thought that he told you a certain thing, and then it just didn't right. You were wrong. This is how we learn over time. Nobody gets discernment just boom, and everything, you got it. And it's in, in everything, and you never make a mistake. As you go with Lord, some people say, you know, man, I heard from the Lord. And it's so good that you're, you you got somebody that you're close to and said, you didn't hear from the Lord. You heard, you're all wet. And then you say, we'll see. And, you know, and then you walk that thing along, and without making a rash decision, you see things come together. Is it, can anybody help me out here? Is this right? As we mature in the Lord, our discernment develops and increases. And, you know, you might be shucking and jiving in this, and, and still sometimes you miss it. I know that I've had several times in the ministry, I've been, in, in the past 10, 12 years, I thought that something was a certain way, and then I found out, Poop, it's not. I find out that someone is a certain way, and, and all I got was, there's something not right there. Yeah. What is it? I just don't, there's something not right. And then, boom, they're out of the closet. Y'all know that picture? There's a really important lesson in the scripture. People are not our problem. You know, they all say, and if it wasn't for people, I'd have a wonderful life. If it wasn't for my husband, I'd have a wonderful marriage. Man, church is great if it weren't for people. I love my job, but the people that I work with. Point number two is a powerful statement. Number two is, if you think that you have more than one enemy, you are deceived. Yeah, it's good, but people don't like this. But this is true. You think you're wrestling with your wife, you're not wrestling with your wife. You think you're wrestling with your husband, you're not wrestling with you. Think you think listen, in Ephesians 6, 12, it says, For we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirit forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Supernatural sphere. So your wife and your problem, your husband and your problem, your kids and your problem, your, your, your friends aren't your problem. It's not the whites. It's not the blacks. Oh, he said white. Why? I am white. In Russia, they said, you ain't that white. You look like one of those dark guys. You know, people are all offended if you say what something is. Oh, yeah, it's, it's real true. I was sitting with a guy who ran for a uh, public office. We were having uh, dinner with him over on the North Shore, and we were talking politics. He, you know, he loves, of course, he runs ran for office, and so he loves to talk politics. And, and he was talking about political correctness. And he said, we can say anything that we want about anything, but it comes down to it. He 
He said, the problem is not the blacks, the whites, the Mexicans, the this, the that, or what we call things. It's not if we call something this or don't call it that. He says, it's the heart of man is wicked and we need to be saved. Amen. And there ain't no day going to happen when they say in Washington, we've discovered today. Wolf Wolf Blitzer, CNN. We've discovered today that our real problem in this country is people need Jesus Christ. <laughs> Listen, that ain't gonna happen. Oh no. So the people are not your problem. How do you know? You know that old song? The Bible tells you so. <laughs> We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Behind every divorce, there's a spirit. Behind every relational discord, there is a spirit. There, listen, behind adultery, there is a spirit. Behind thievery, there is a spirit. Behind gossip and church disorder and, 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 and destruction, I'm telling you, it's not the person, it's a spirit. People can leave a church, but the spirit remains there. That's how the same thing happens over if you notice in the church. Year after year after year, the same thing will happen and they'll jump onto a new person. <laughs> Is this getting good? That's why we shouldn't get mad at a person. We should get mad at the devil and stand for Jesus. I think the greatest thing that we can do in this is not let the, 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 an evil spirit manifest in our own personal life. When a person has God's anointing on their life, and week after week they hear God's word, and they never get involved with the work of the Lord, you know, we can call them, we can say, oh, they have a calling on their life, but, but they're being held back, and, and are, you know, and they're never given an opportunity. How about it's a spirit of laziness? You know? How about it's a spirit of not jumping on board? You can do anything that God has called you to do. There is nobody holding you back. The Spirit of God lives inside of you. And God has called you to do great things. I'll tell you that every person here, God has called you to do great things that you are not presently doing. And we're supposed to be increasing and increasing and increasing and doing more for the Lord. If you're not doing it for the Lord, tell me something. Who is? Ooh, this is going over real good. <laughs> Let me add some balance to point number two in regards to relationships. Relational breakdowns start with an accusation. And scripture tells us that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. Did it say that? Yeah. So when accusation is made, you can't just say, well, that's not true. Now nah, that's a spirit. That's a Listen, if somebody tells you that you've got a tail that's green and six feet long, look, don't worry about that. Two or three people tell you you've got a tail that's green and six feet long. What's going on back there? Something that somebody tells you could be true. But if it isn't true, then it isn't true. We always need to take a look at ourselves. Hmm. You like it? See if there's any truth to it. Number three. Everybody's not going to be excited about your discernment. And they weren't excited about Paul's discernment. Can you imagine that you discern something in a friend that's trying to get close to you and you say, you know, uh, I, I'm just, I don't, I don't believe we're going to do this. They're not, if you tell them that you're not wanting to do the thing that they're wanting to do, they're not going to be happy about it. You don't have to mention spirit or nothing. Okay. It doesn't matter if it's your pastor, your old friends sitting in the bar room that you used to inhabit. It doesn't matter. They are not going to be happy. Acts 16, verse 19. But when her owners discovered that their hope of profit was gone, they caught hold of Paul and Silas in dragging them before the authorities in the forum marketplace where trials are held and, and when they had brought them before the magistrates they declared these fellows are Jews and they are throwing our city into great confusion. Oh, really? That's the problem? 
Okay, underline this next part, verse 21. They encourage the practice of their customs, which it is unlawful for us Romans to accept and observe. And they're all of a sudden law-abiding citizens. Listen, lie, lie, lie. And they weren't concerned about Paul and Silas confusing any Roman laws or customs or something like that. They were mad because they weren't getting the money from the fortune teller. I mean, the scripture says that. And then the scripture goes on to say that they were lying about it. Verse 22, the crowd also joined in the attack upon them, and the rulers tore the clothes off of them and commanded that they be beaten with rods. And when they had struck them, many blows. Listen, this is bad. Being beat with rods? Oh. They threw them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. He, having received so strict a charge, put them into the inner, underline this part, the inner prison, the dungeon, and fastened their feet in stocks. Yeah. Now listen, y'all might know where this is going, and, and everybody can say it and, and all of that stuff, but I'm saving that for next week because I want to focus on this right here. Now we have a problem here. First off, they should not have beaten Roman citizens. That's bad. So they're going to get in trouble for that. But there's something else here. I don't think I put it on there. Put it at point number four. Do you have point number four? You got room to write it. Put this in there. When you belong to God, people don't know who they're messing. Come on now. I'm telling you, when you belong to God, and you have to take this attitude, come on, child. I might not have it all together all the time. I might not be acting right all the time. Everything might not come right out of my mouth all the time. But God loves me and I'm a child of God and he watches over me. And when everything, when they try to bring it court and everything falls apart and everything, listen, the fat lady hadn't sung yet. You just stand firm. Some kind of way, this thing is going to be worked out for you. You see the end of verse 24, they put their feet in stocks. Well, these guys knew the scripture a little bit, being Jewish. And they knew that Joshua, chapter 1, verse 3, I don't have it in there, but it says, that every place of the soles of your foot walk, it belongs to you. So that prison didn't belong to them. They could wear that thing once they went in there. And when their feet were put in those stocks, they, they're about to own the jail. That's what I'm talking about. That I said, they're about to own the jail. No, no, hey, hey, come on now. I said, they're about to own this jail. Listen to the story of the Israelites defeating the Syrian army. I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but here's one scripture. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 12. One of his servants said, None, my Lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, tells the king of Israel, like, watch this. They all have their spies. But Israel had a prophet. And he didn't even need to be there. And he's whispering to the king what's going on with the enemy. Oh, oh, oh king, but Elijah, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedchamber. Oh, that's what you say. Holy Moses. Moses was a holy man. 2,500 years before the CIA could bug a bedroom, the prophet of God is, is listening in and, and hearing in on what's going on and, and telling the Israeli army how to act. Now, come on. Can you think these, these nutcases over there in, in, in the Middle East are going to come against the Israeli army today? I don't think so. Listen, we don't have to worry about that. Don't worry about who has a bomb. Listen, I read, read the end of the book. Israel's going to win. I said Amen. Israel's going to win. Amen. Come on, I said Israel's going to win. Amen. Man, look, look, they put a buck open on three forces back in the 67 war. Yo, just YouTube the history of the Israeli war. 67, 66, whatever. Yom Kippur war. Yeah. So the, verse 14, so the Syrian king sent their horses, chariots, a great army. They came by night surrounding the city. When the servant of God rose early and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots around the city. Elijah's servant said to him, Alas, my master, 
What are we going to do? So this is Elijah's servant. This isn't Elijah. And he's a little fearful because he's not seeing in the supernatural. He's just looking at the natural. Anybody know people like that? They're all flustered and concerned. What are we going to do? What, what, I mean, what, what, what are you going to do? What? Listen, when you're in a tight situation, don't ask some spiritual inward what they want to, what are they going to do or what do they think. You don't need to know what they think. See what God says about you in your situation. Where was I? I'm getting a little fired up here. That's okay. Elijah's servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? That's why he's the servant. Elijah answered, Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. He said, fear not. I looked it up. Fear not in some kind of way. It might not be fear not, but don't worry, don't be anxious is more than 80 times in the Word of God. Somebody will say that there's one for 365 days of the year. Well, there's not. 80 plus is enough for me, huh? How about you? Is, it, is 80 enough? 80 times he said, he said that in my words. Fear not for those who with us are more than those with them. Underline that right there. You need to put that on your refrigerator. Your refrigerator will all be all covered with stuff here. Fear not for those with us are more than those with them. Then Elijah prayed, Lord, I pray you open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elijah. There are unseen forces that are on your side. They're camped out around your house. They're camped out around your business. They're camped out around your classroom. They're, they're yours, your business, your home. I mean, there are unseen forces. So this is how it came down. God blinded the Syrian army. And they were annihilated. The odds were beyond count. And God got the victory that day. And I'm telling you that God is going to get the victory in your case. The only way that God will not get the victory in your case is if you give up. If you give up, say, I've been down this road too many times. I can't take this anymore. I can't take this anymore. Listen, uh, giving up is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. You give up, listen, you just write W on your forehead with a sharp Okay? Listen. Okay, now this is how it came down. Back to, back to Paul. The Philippian maximum security prison was no holiday inn. But like I told you, they owned it. With their backs bruised, bruised and torn, no medical attention, couldn't call 911. Their feet are in lockdown and in Acts 16 25, but about midnight. <laughs> Woo! Come on now, about midnight. I'm talking, I'm talking about the midnight call. I'm talking about at midnight. And when, when you think God ain't showing up, he's showing up. Out of the middle of nowhere. When, when all is lost and you, and you just don't know. Listen, listen what it says. As Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God and the other prisoners were listening. You know what the other prisoners were probably think? They must be crazy. They've lost their minds. They beat them beyond, beyond their senses. <laughs> Just imagine Paul singing tenor, Silas singing baritone, God joins in with a thundering bass. Boom! Man, I'm telling you, it's flying around there. And God always does it suddenly. And in verse 26 it says, suddenly there was an earthquake. That happened when Jesus died. Mm. Suddenly there was an earthquake so that the very foundations of the prison were shaken. You know, we need our, our foundations shaken and shook so that God puts it back on his rock of salvation. Foundations of the prison were shaken and at once all the doors were opened and everyone's shackles were unfastened. Ah! Everybody got free that night. Yeah. The greatest prison of the ages is not a physical prison, but an invisible prison where people remain on their own free will and, and, and what they ask for. What, what's that new color you put in here? The green thing? Uh, uh, antique and stuff. Antique and stuff. 
Doesn't just sound well. <laughs> you want to come out of your jail cell? You want to come out of your jail cell? You want to come out of your jail cell? What about you? No. Just pay my bars and take what's going on. I'll just stay here for a while. I'll just redecorate. <laughs> Yeah. 